the, the workload was very unsteady. Uh, they weren't buying, they weren't fixing up things or putting any money back into the plant. You could see that they were, they were not interested in the upkeep of uh, machinery and uh, things like that. So there were signs that uh, this was about to happen. They gave us the plant closing letter and that's when total destruction happened here. We ended up with like I think two customers or something like that. We went down to 24 people in the building on the floor. I'm not sure how many were still in salary but I mean it just, it was like a ghost town in here. I have enough talent to get another job somewhere else but at, what is it? 42. I remember coming home the day that he was laid off too. We didn't think he would be because he had so many years of service. We were taken over by a, um, a manager, an upper level manager that came from a shop that did never built molds. He was a smart man, uh, but he did a lot of things and they made a lot of changes. That in my 40 years of, of mold making, I, I, I thought maybe I missed something and uh, I was wondering, what are, they, what are they doing? Something's going crazy here. Uh, things weren't, weren't right. Um, we were actually driven out of business. That, that's the only way I can say it. We were by. Tredegar. They just did not run the company uh, as most of us felt it should be run. Building molds wasn't their field, really. They were mostly in oils and metals. They made decisions based on uh, what it categorically should be under perfect conditions if you manage this way. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Uh, you, especially in mold making, you have to be. You have to live and breathe the heartbeat. You got to be there every minute and decisions have to be made uh, on the spot. They laid out better than half our force. I mean, we were in here with about 24 people out of approximately 96 originally, and uh, it gets kind of scary. And when you see what GE's doing and all these other companies in the city going, what prospect do you have for, for finding a good job? I had been here for, you know, 18 years, and it was like, what do I do now? You know, what am I gonna do? And somebody in the union happened to mention, well, what do, you, what do you think of the idea of us buying the company out ourselves? And it was kind of like a shock. You know, I was like, can we really do that? You know, was... I got a call, as I recall, um, around Christmas time, and, uh, or maybe slightly before, uh, saying that this company was in trouble, that uh, it was up for sale, that there were perhaps some tire kickers around looking at it, um, and maybe we should consider it. And I uh, went up and talked with uh, Don Madison. After 25 years of unionism and corporate ownership, we had the traditional union management adversarial power struggle that exists in so many companies. And they were, it was an adversarial relationship. And I mean, you were really trained in that. You were trained that it was supposed to be that way and you made sure it was that way because that's the way it was supposed to be. It doesn't matter what management says to you, you do not believe it, not at all. If, I don't know, if they said they were going to do something for you, say, we're going to promote you, you wouldn't believe it. Because you, th you would think that uh, this was another way for them to get more out of you or or hold you down or something one way or the other and, and it seems silly if something someone said to you I'm gonna promote you and then you felt it was some way they were gonna hold you back this happens though I mean it's crazy but it happens people feel this way Don I think at the time didn't quite know what to make of us I mean he saw us as union it was a hard sell 
the idea came forward from the IUE about the the union and employee buyout, and that made a lot of sense. Okay, that was uh, because it was uh, it was going to create a culture where we would all have to cooperate together. Um, it was going to be management. It couldn't do it without the existing management. We needed the existing management. We needed the existing union. It was going to make us change the way we've been thinking about each other and the way we we do business. It bothered us to see this company die. I mean, you know, we've grown up with this company. It's like a friend probably hundreds of thousands of these kinds of businesses that closed for exactly the same reasons. Distant corporate owners that bought and sold businesses without really being rooted in the community and being committed to the people. After the decision was made, after we got the word that this place was going to close and the buyout process started, all the odds were against us. It was really a long shot that the buyout was going to go through, but you saw a different attitude among the people because now you were, you were you were working for yourself one way or the other, whether the buyout went through or not, and uh, now you had, you had hope. The buyout was not easy. It took, it took a long time. It took 10 months. It was, um, it was an emotional roller coaster. Um, I would get a call for one day that we, would, that we were two hours away from signing, and then I would get a call an hour, an hour, half an hour later saying the deal was off. And so, you know, one day you felt like dancing, the next day you felt like crying. I mean, we had a hard time keeping the spirits of management people and supervisory people up. Probably as, as hard a time keeping their spirits up as we did keeping the spirits of the working people up. These guys would go up to their least favorite foreman or their least favorite supervisor and say, when we own the company, your history. It was hard, you know, because you didn't know from day, and it was, Tiring on your nerves because you didn't know what you're going to do when you came in the door, if you were going to come in the door. One of the big misunderstandings that employees have who want to buy a company is they think, but I don't have the money to buy a company. That's a big misunderstanding. When Donald Trump buys a casino, he doesn't use cash in his dresser or in his savings account. He goes to a bank and provides a business plan and they provide the money. That's what an employee stock ownership plan does. It allows you to buy a company using the assets of the company as collateral, not your house, not your car. So it's important to not be worried about the money issue. The only issue to be worried about is time and whether a business plan shows that this company can be profitably operated. When it first started, and they said, well, we're going to buy the company, and I said, well, <clears throat> didn't work before. What makes you think it's going to work afterwards? You know, get the same management, same people, you know, what's going to change? You know, why, why is it going to be any better? And, but it was. It was. Everybody had a different attitude. Uh, everything turned around. Uh, we were doing things. I mean, rework almost like disappeared, you know. Like people were doing their jobs right. We were doing them on time. A couple of good ideas. Uh, people at the lower level are saying, gee, why don't we do this and do that and do this? And, gee, that's not a bad idea. Why don't you tell me about that before? Well, nobody would listen before. Well, why bother? You know, nobody cared. But now they do. So uh, you're getting a lot of ideas from the lower levels, and it's just amazing. I wouldn't have believed it, the difference. It's a total, complete turnaround. Marlin was a troubled company, but it was right for this type of a buyout. Okay? We had good enough equipment to, to make a product and make a profit, and our people were solid. We knew what we had to do to be successful. We just had to go out and do it. Everyone had to work. Instead of 100, 110%, they had to give 200%. They had to work extra. They had to run uh, really all out flat all the time. We've had a lot of uh, repeat type work. Moles that we had built under Tredegar with 126 people. And we knew that it took us, I'll give you an example, it might have taken us 3,000 hours to build this tool. We started building it in 2,200 hours. We started to see productivity gains that were like 25, 30%. Uh, and that was the 42 people pulling together as a team. Before, people didn't care whether you made money or not because it didn't affect their pocket. They were gonna always get their paycheck as long as they did an adequate job. And you know how the company did overall, I don't think uh, the, the average person, I mean, it's not that they didn't want to do a good job. Everybody wants to do a good job, but you think more consciously, I think, when you own part of the business than when you don't own the business. And I, as I say, I think that we've shown that with the efficiency that we picked up. A lot of our customers were great. They held on and they came back to us right away. So our customers took a chance and we showed them that we could give them a, the best quality product, 
in the least amount of time. That employee ownership is not magic dust that you sprinkle on a company and all of a sudden people have this enormous incentive and motivation. It's the basement on which you build the first floor of a successful business and that requires all of the normal type of business skills and entrepreneurial skills which uh, business people have come to value over the years. There are no handbooks out there that you can go out and get and says, okay, we're going to be employee-owned now and this is how we do it. There is no road map, okay. I think there will be down the road from companies like Marlin and things as, as we uh, document what we've done. Um, th you know, there might be some aid for future companies, but I wasn't able to find that. Do I feel like an employee owner? Sometimes I do, a lot of times I don't. The change, I don't think the full commitment's there from the top down. I think there's gaps in it somewhere along the line. Uh, the old management is running the same company. They're trying to change, but it seems that they run it the same way they've done in the past, to a degree. Uh, something, there's minor changes, but we can't expect change overnight. It's going to take us. I mean, we're into two years now. I see more change because I'm involved more with the whole picture than most people out on the floor. I mean, we do have our meetings, our monthly meeting, or our state of the business meeting whenever, and uh, there's numbers thrown on the boards, this and that and everything. We're not educated for all them numbers. Uh, some of us are, some of us understand some of them. Most of the people don't. So we got to get educated that way too. We got to get educated in how the business runs. And every time anybody felt that they had any failure was because they didn't properly uh, educate and train their people. Um, you know, I read stories about one company that gave everybody 18% of the stock and nothing changed, absolutely nothing changed because they didn't understand what that 18% meant to them. Some people who have always held power have to, have to share that power now. Not give it up, but share it now. Other people who've never wanted any responsibility are going to have to take responsibility, whether you want it or not. You people know more than we do about what happens out on the floor, and what we're trying to do is to get that information so our budget is going to be more accurate. Um, so that's, that's some of the things that we set out early on in the first year. We did extensive training and, and, um, and ESOP training as to what the basic fundamentals of an ESOP was, how it worked. Uh, we, went through every, we went through the entire ESOP plan, but even more than that, we, we, we sat with the employees and we had a, a three-day training session that said, this is my role as an employee, this is my role as an employee owner, okay? this is my role as a union member, right? um, and tried to identify uh, you know, even to the point of um, if you were a board of directors, if you were an employee board of director, how did, how did you function in your everyday and what was your responsibility as a director? What's my responsibility as an employer? And you have to be able to wear those different hats. Okay. You have to consider your employees as the, probably the most valuable asset that you have. What the hell do you have if you don't have them? You can't get anything done without them. And we, I, hopefully everybody recognizes that. and. That's where you have to turn your attention when you have problems. Let them solve them. Who does it every day of the week? They do. You don't. They do. Let them do it. There's a lot of smart people on the floor, and they have an awful lot of good suggestions. And if somebody sees that they want to make a process improvement, they write up a slip, and it's reviewed by a committee. And then, you know, within so many either weeks or whatever, the committee has to get back to the person to either say, yes, we're going to implement it, or, you know, we need to study further, or whatever the process is. But it's a committee between the management and the hourly people around the committee. We just, we just rebuilt it recently, me and uh, another guy here. <clears throat> this here we've been using for a long time. And it used to be on a magnetic uh, chuck, so we basically freed up the magnet so we could use it in other places. Some of the stumbling blocks that we had in manufacturing certain components and turned it around so that we are in an extremely profitable situation with these components. At one time, we were lucky if we broke even with them. You see more committees that have both in rather than just management people, which is good because you are uh, being able to get ideas from the people on the floor. And I mean, they're the ones who do the work, so they should know it better than anybody. Now, what distinguishes this company from others uh, is that it was formed as an ESOP to save the jobs of the employees and the labor union stepped forward and sponsored that. The function of the board in all this has been to uh, 
in a very consistent way, uh, apply focus uh, and discipline, and to teach people uh, what the issues are, both short and long term. At first, you feel whether you, you're not sure whether you should even ask questions, but I've been pretty forward, and, and I've always asked questions. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm the chairman of the board. Uh, Richard Cole, if he sees a question on my, maybe a question on my face, so to speak, he'll ask me if there is a question. Uh, if there's something I don't understand, they, they're patient with me and they take the time to explain. And this is all, all uh, a part of it, uh, my education, so to speak. I had argued for and got the board to uh, adopt a policy of allowing the elected members of the workforce on the board to bring guests. And they've pretty much all um, done that and we've cycled through most of the employees of the company so that they see how decisions are made at the board level. I've been into a board of director meeting and they really impressed me. And our board here, uh, a few of the fellows impressed me on how they ask questions and things like that. Down the road, you don't know. But all I can say, and I try and impress this upon the younger employees, if this works, and you get 25 to 30 years under this plan of you know, these stocks and bonds, you can walk out of here a very rich person, if it works. I think the hardest thing was not, not the hourly employees, because they wanted this change. They welcomed the change. They welcomed the, uh, the ability to, be in, to get involved. They wanted that participatory type management um, where the hardest part was for the, the veteran uh, middle manager who's been used to and paid all his life to make decisions, okay? And if we wanted to buy a new piece of equipment, he would research that, he would go out, he would choose what he felt was the best piece of equipment, and he would buy it. Well, now, all of a sudden, we were going to, we put a committee together from the people out on the floor that were going to use that piece of equipment, we got them involved. Now that same process is refined after three years, and it takes probably a month to six weeks to go through that same process that took us six months the first few years we're in business. Rather than just a manager going by and something that who may really not know exactly what's going on with it, get the guy who's going to use it. What's he prefer? What's he have to do? What's wrong with the machine he has? What does the new one have better? And uh, you get three or four of these people and uh, get together and you start throwing things around him. You come up with ideas you wouldn't have thought about. Once it's on the floor and the guy could say, hey, I helped choose this machine, you know. Now, this is what they gave me. Because they can make it work or not make it work. That you want to learn as much as you can, uh, as much as you can about them before you put down $150,000 on them. So I think it's, uh, we need a little bit of patience with everybody here, with management and with the guys on the floor. Because uh, they learning in, on the other side, management is learning how we're changing, and we got to learn too how they got to change too. You have learned one way to manage. Now someone comes to you and says, you have to change your way of managing. From now on, you will no longer tell anyone what to do. You will ask them for help. And you will involve them in the decision making that you made yourself. It was a slow road coming back, but you know, we, we were able to do that. One time in Tredegar, we were struggling to get six million dollars worth of sales and we had 242 customers struggling for six million. And we have 38 customers now doing eight and a half and almost nine million. So um, one of the things that the new company has done is has been very focused on a niche market, okay? Um, part of our business plan, we put together the business plan, was that we would concentrate on what we do best. And these things are very, very difficult to design. And the tolerances on some of these products are as closer, if not closer, than on some of your real high-tech applications. A typical assignment that you'd get on a, on a jig grinding machine would be to grind in the plastic mold this area that I've marked in red. It's a tamper-evident band on a bottle cap. And you'll, you'll see a beverage mold further on down the line. But we grind this stripe in here, and it's, it's actually a very precise dimension because this stripe has to show whether or not somebody's been tampering with a bottle. We happen to be in a very unique position where the union and management uh, put together a very sound plan, and we are where we are today because of that. We find 
Instead of confrontation, cooperation goes a lot farther. It helps us to get where we are today. It proves to a lot of people that union and management can work together to make it better and provide jobs for everyone. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm not used to putting out com uh, compliments like this to uh, Don, for one. No. <laughs> Believe me, it hurts me more than uh, what you realize. Because I'm usually used to sitting with him and uh, Ray, my chief shop steward here, across the table and arguing all the time. You know, we had a lot of discussion when we became employee-owned as to how, you know, people came right out in the meetings and said, well, what do we need a union for if we own the company? Well, you still need a union. A union is good. I mean, it's, uh, it's a, um, there are vehicles in place for settling grievances. There's a process in place to, to deal with um, compensation and the benefits and the wages. And we've been, we're all used to this environment. It's, a, you know, from a, from a management standpoint, um, you sit down and you negotiate the contract and you negotiate it for the next three years and you put it behind you, you know. The sixth or seventh, they were having a seminar out in Ohio, in Canton, Ohio, on uh, union shops and new ways to negotiate. So it was, um, I, I loaded up the negotiating team from both sides and we took six people, and seven of us actually, and we went out to Ohio and we went to the seminar. We attended, uh, you know, the two-day seminar and then came back on Friday to resolve our contract in about four or five hours. And um, well, The last time we had an ESOP tour through the building, one of the questions, I was out running the machines, one of the questions was, when was the last time you had a grievance? I said, as a matter of fact, I had put two in that Monday, you know, and I said, I'm sorry, but it does still happen. Under the ownership plan, uh, I feel like we have more say. For example, if the foreman says, gee, why don't you do this job this way? and you have a better idea, you can explain to him this idea, your idea is a little bit better, okay? And he'll say, okay, Mitch, go on and do it your way then, okay? Well, I can tell you a good example is people, uh, before we were owned by Tredegar, it was unthinkable for a person to run more than one machine at a time, but it's not today. Over in our CNC area, the guys are running two and sometimes three machines at a time, depending on the type of work. If the work allows it, they do it. You know, I mean, sometimes, all right, a fellow might be stuck on one machine for, for eight hours. But if he's got, you know, a good long-run job, he'll take and run another machine. So, like I say, it was unthinkable before. If I see something wrong or something that I don't agree with, I feel comfortable with going to my foreman going to my vice president or going to my CEO and telling them. And uh, this is something that wasn't there before. Nobody in the wildest dreams expected us to do as well as we did. And um, I, I think that was probably the biggest shock that I had. <laughs> Because we had years of corporate environment and years of other people making decisions and I can't say they were all bad, but it's hard when somebody two or three thousand miles away is making a decision and they're not on the spot. And so, you know, as I say, I think that uh, that was probably a big surprise. There are still people who will always see their cups as half empty. Uh, they're fortunately in the minority. Um, and it's going to take some effort to change that. We've had our ups and downs. It's, it hasn't been an easy task, uh, and we're still learning. Seeing the foreman come out of his office and right away having the hair on my neck stand up, it doesn't. It did look like management was sitting there in their office with their feet up. Okay. But now that I'm into it and I've learned uh, how how, how their jobs, what their jobs are and what their responsibilities are, I can understand why it would cost so much to replace them, and it would. Once you become an employee owned, the pride is there. They're really um, interested in what goes out the door. That's what makes it go. The great thing about this is I'm on the board of directors. I would have never, ever been on the board of directors anywhere. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. It's a great job, and I love it. And now when I speak on the board of directors to all these people, 
that are far better educated than myself. When I, when I say something, these people listen to me. Five years ago, if I said something uh, to a, a bunch of people that are business type people in a room, they would have just looked the other way. So, well, who's this guy? He has indeed become a diplomat. He'll listen to both sides and try to reason what's fair, what's unfair. Um, and I find it does spill over a little bit into personal life at home. Uh, he's you know, very willing to listen to, to the kids. Uh, they come up with some hair brain idea or something. He's, instead of flying off the handle right away, well, well, let's hear about this. You know, what, what do you think about it and this and that. So um, I do see a lot of positive changes that way. And, uh, and I think a, a good change, too, is uh, the way he has, again, taken an interest in reading. We're talking about family values. We're talking about people who had this company closed, would have been without jobs, would have been, in order to get jobs, would have had to uproot their families, move them all over the country, perhaps not getting similar work with similar income, um, and the kind of disruption that that kind of behavior engenders has tremendous costs that nobody measures. So what we're really talking about is creating a method by which we employ our people which contributes to long-term stability of family and community. I think everybody's going to benefit the way we're doing it now, okay? And this is the way it, this is the way it should have been done a long time ago, okay? They say we're an exception, but uh, I didn't think we started off with exceptional people. Everybody was doing their job adequately, but uh, a lot of them have become exceptional since it happened. I'm a member of the board of directors, but I'm also a union member. And being on a board of directors is a great education. <coughs> if anyone gets a chance, they should go for it. Because you, hear, you get to hear both sides of the story. The company side or management side, and the union side, you always you kn you know that already by being in the union and being a worker. And sometimes you have to walk a very fine line because there's decisions that have to be made that are not going to be what everyone wants to hear, but they're going to have to be made for the, be the better of the company. And uh, this all comes down to communications with everyone that works in the company, whether they be management or hourly paid. It's sharing information and getting employees involved. That's basically all it is, is just taking ownership. It's not just saying I own a piece of Marlin Mole. It's making Marlin Mole work.